Hello, I'm Morse Kohansky, Wilderness Living Skills and Survival Instructor specializing in the Boreal Forest. And sitting beside me here is a longtime guru, Tom Roycroft. Thomas Roycroft, but he always calls himself Tom. So. And <laughs> we, uh, what do we must have met? I can remember clearly the day we met on the street, but it must have been somewhere in 1968 or seven or something in there, early the, the, the latter part of the 60s. I'd driven by the survival school many times in my duties as a welfare officer, and I was intimidated by the signs. And I wanted to go in and ask about this Department of National Defense Survival School. And one day I'm doing work in downtown Hinton and there's a person wearing a uniform that uh, looks military, but it had civilian instructor on the epaulette, I believe. So I said, hey, do you by any chance work at that school? And Tom and I must have talked I remember probably four hours or something long like that. Quite a bit of time. You know? <laughs> Talking there. Well, anyway, uh, when I met Tom, I think I had a little bit of a bush library. I had made the decision that I was going to write a, something like a scout manual, you might say, for adults on the out of doors. And as I talked to him, I began to realize that I couldn't place the books he owned. Because normally, after I talked to people, I could tell what books they had by what they said because of the familiarity the, uh, of the various authors of the day, which wasn't long. Anyway, there are many things that I uh, picked up from Tom and, and many things that he gave me that I still have. Uh, probably the most outstanding thing is the ski shoe that I call the ski shoe. And now Tom is a pretty humble fellow. He wouldn't call this a Roycroft ski shoe. Uh, <clears throat> neither would I like to call something I invented by my own name. Other people have to do that for you, sort of thing. Well, anyway, to me, this is uh, uh, something that I wanted to acknowledge Tom's ingenuity, Tom's inventiveness, and he came up with the concept, and it's earned me a good living for most of my, my career, because in the northern forest where the snow is deep, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, snowshoe, ski shoe, I call it a ski shoe because you tend to ski and, and snowshoe at the same time. Now, I'll have Tom tell us a little about it. Uh, it takes steps of evolution. Did it come to you all of a sudden? or? Well, it came to me because I was civilian instructor at the survival school. And they decided that uh, if a man was down in the winter in the bush, that he should make an improvised snowshoe. And so some of the military people got together and they brought them out to Jarvis Lake to test. And they put them on, every one of them, the shoes just fell apart, you know, before they'd gone 10 steps. And so I thought, well, there must be a better way. So yeah, I took a bunch of uh, material as you see here and I built something very, very similar to this. And that was adopted by the survival school as a standard, and it was taught for as long as I was there. They moved the survival school down to the east somewhere. I don't know if they talk about it now, but they probably do have something like it. But yeah, that's that was the original one, because everything else failed, and the survival school said we had to have an, something improvised. Yeah, that was kind of a useful device that, uh, and then I've never seen any any literature or anything that shows something similar to that. Now generally, when I made mine, they were just slightly smaller than this, but um, it was all the basic thing. and. Um, if a person wanted to get fancy, like you could bend up the tip and pull it back and tie a cord or something, but that's pretty good because most most sticks like that 
have a natural bend and you just put the natural bend in the natural place and there you are. Well, I, uh, I would say that uh, if a person had to, you could probably write about a 300 page book on all the variations and, and all that. But uh, here we, we come, it comes from the horse's mouth, the person who came up with the idea. And if Tom hadn't come up with the idea, it probably still wouldn't be around. So it's, uh, it's uh, one, of those, one of those especially unique things. I, I think the original one was taken to Edmonton and the survival school had kind of a, kind of a showroom where they showed people things. Uh, another thing that that has got the name Roycroft attached to it is the triangular pack frame of which we have a bit here. There are some things that pa Tom hasn't seen on here, but as time goes on, I've seen many uh, variations here. This is a pack frame that's built according to your size with the the uh, bar here, armpit to fingertip, uh, I mean elbow to fingertip, and then armpit to fingertip for the longer pieces and thereabouts. Uh, tell us uh, a bit about uh, the development of this particular device. Well, the survival school decided that they needed some way of, for a pilot to come down the woods, something that he could use, uh, make to carry a pack. And the survival school staff went and made a whole bunch of things and uh, none of them were, were very satisfactory. But uh, I came up with this A-frame and they adopted that as a standard and every, at one time, everyone on the course had to build an improvised uh, pack frame. And uh, it's, it's a very simple device the main mistake that people make is that they don't figure on the fact that this is going to be across your backside and it'll dig in. And if possible, you, well, there's two solutions. You could have a curved stick here so that it fit better on your back. But what's just as good is to have your material that you're carrying, like your sleeping bag and so on, puffing out on the back side and uh, where, whichever is the back side. And uh, so that there's no chance that any of this wood is going to rub against your back. It's um, very simple. Like uh, many things, whether ski shoe or the pack frame, you look at the situation at hand and you build accordingly. So. If you have deep powdery snow, you'd build a bigger ski shoe. Uh, otherwise, you end up going to the store and you end up buying uh, a snowshoe which does not change in shape or style. Uh, this, uh, the pack frame is something similar. Uh, it demands a little bit more input, but you can adapt it to many different type of uh, conditions. If you're carrying huge, bulky, light stuff, you're carrying really heavy loads, you're carrying a haunch of moose, and so on. So, but the the concept of the simplicity of the triangle, and uh, there, are, there are variations. Uh, these little things here are put on that instead of a ring and a string, you instead of reaching around and trying to uh, uh, wrap the cord that lashes the load on, you've got means to get around that and so on. But the concept is there. And again, uh, just like the the ski shoe, I've never seen anyone present this form. And actually. This form of pack frame is a marvelous way of teaching people the principles of how to carry a load and so on. But the important thing is that you must have a soft bulge come out through that triangle to, uh, to uh, give that padding. any problem. Yeah. Uh, with your back getting sore from the crossbar. Yeah, the, uh, the, the circumstance is you usually have a cover, uh, maybe your shelter tarp goes down and then you lay the non-compressible uh, things like all your clothing and everything to fill that triangle so that as you tie your load on, it pushes that bulge out so it fits nicely in the small of the back and between the shoulder blades and so on and so on. Uh, I have actually personally had 
people persist in working with this because I would insist you have to build your pack frame rather than build a commercial one. And in the end they would say, oh, this is way more comfortable than anything I've ever used. And I said, well, yes, you kept working at it till it became as comfortable as you wanted it to be. Whereas you buy something and things that are, are fitted for a ghost very often aren't really adjustable that much. And not only that, but the price is right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, they now then the RCAF issue. Am I right in thinking that that pot sort of came in the RCAF survival kits? I think it was a, a, an army uh, kit. Um, but you know, army, air force, it was military. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Miro was the company that made these. Uh, I remember you saying that that was a very good pot for uh, a cup of tea for seven people and I would say uh, uh, when you're li uh, not living off the land but drinking enough water that's breakfast the perfect amount of breakfast, hot water for breakfast neither too big nor too small now you gave me this pot and I didn't really lose the lid but this morning when I said oh I should bring the pot to show uh, uh, you know, how a pot like this lasts a lifetime. Uh, I've told my wife uh, if she needs a uh, urn for my ashes, this particular <laughs> pot would be very good. But back in probably 1967, you gave me this pot. And actually, it spent 10 years away. Uh, I went to a, 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 a teen time program, it was called. And my pot got left there, and I came back 10 years later. And I said, where's my pot? Because I remember when I left there, sure enough, I found it in amongst all the stuff and got it back. So, on. but anyway, the, the pot that's so durable, it's got all these features that you really want in a useful pot and especially in perhaps the issue of boiling water in survival. Um, the other thing here is, there's a scarf you gave me. And probably the scenery back behind us is in a, a situation where the sand uh, gets picked up and is blown. And I think one of the most useful things is to have a scarf that if you uh, uh, have that at least, that you can put this over your face and, and I can still see through it, but the sand doesn't get in my, in my mouth and so on. And you can still survive living out of that. Now, historically, Tell us a little bit about the scarf. Well, it was just a piece of parachute cloth and uh, we used parachute cloth for almost everything because every aircraft, uh, not every aircraft, but most aircraft carried par uh, parachutes for the crew. and. Um, you can improvise almost anything you want, you know. You could carry snow in it to, for, to bring, uh, to make water from. You could carry, you know, if you come across a big patch of mushrooms, all of a sudden you've got something to put the mushrooms in. And uh, it's very useful. And uh, in mosquito time, it gives you extra protection. Uh, it's it's an excellent thing. And it doesn't take very much room. Well, that covers quite a few, well, not a few, but some of the things that really were important to me uh, in, in the sense of uh, those things I picked up from you early, early, early in my career. But there are other things that, uh, that know, we I might... I was just thinking, when I was about 10 years old, I got to thinking what I was going to do with my life and the only thing I'd read some books or uh, you know comics and that sort of thing and I thought the best thing in the world would to be outdoors and uh, uh, making your life in the uh, you know in the, in the wilderness uh, to some extent and uh, I was fortunate in that most of my working life, that's what I did when I was in the military. I was teaching survival, 
We were in pararescue and we had parachutes to work with. We used them for all sorts of improvisations. And being in pararescue, I found that suddenly I was teaching courses uh, all over. You know, the Boy Scouts would ask someone to come and things like that. And uh, it just became one of the one of the uh, little jobs that we had to do because you know the the um, the military the CO was always anxious to have publicity for his school and if a school group wanted some assistance in the outdoors well he'd always send an instructor and uh, it just sort of grew naturally and of course uh, when the when I worked for the survival school, you know, doing this year after year after year, I could learn a lot by other people's mistakes. I didn't have to make the mistakes myself, I could just watch other people. And uh, at one time we used to have very, very rigorous courses where people would have to go 20 or 30 miles and uh, through the wilderness and uh, all the uh, precautions that uh, were important to remind them of and uh, all the little tricks and, and uh, ways of coping with the uh, difficulties that you might encounter. Uh, to me, it was always the most interesting thing in my life to, to be in this position. Well, how long did you work at the survival school altogether, roughly? Well, I worked there until I had to retire. <laughs> I well, forget what the age was now, <laughs> I think 55. Well, when I met you, I think, if I remember, you'd been at the survival school for 18 years. And then probably you, what, you worked probably another 12, 15 years after that. Well, you see, being in pararescue all over the country, like in Nova Scotia, in the Arctic, I would be called upon to instruct, to take people out. And uh, it was just a natural thing. And that's where I got experience, like in Labrador and Nova Scotia and the high Arctic and um, the Western Arctic. and. I was also stationed on Vancouver Island, and of course, survival instructing was important there. And there, more than likely, one of the important things was teaching people to build a fire in the wet weather. Um, all these little things that come naturally to a person <coughs> when you're doing it, uh, come useful when it comes to instructing people that don't know anything about it. When you... Uh when you worked at the survival school, basically, there were other co-instructors. Yeah. Uh, but generally, what you found that they really it was a five and uh, eight to five, nine to five job for them. They uh, were to not necessarily like when I came there. They had um, uh, mostly native instructors and. Uh, you know, they knew the bush, they lived in the bush, they were raised in the bush. The only trouble was that um, if a moose crossed the trail and they were coming to work sometimes, they figured, well, it's stupid not to follow the moose and get some meat rather than go to work. <laughs> and so that's why they, they settled on us people that didn't... Uh, uh, weren't compelled by yeah. hunger to... <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just a different attitude, you yeah. know? The people knew the work, but they implied it in a different way. Uh, well, when I, uh, when I met you, uh, then very shortly we began to collaborate, uh, work together on a lot of things, and the scenery that we are into here is the area where you had been working for some time and I came in on this by moving from the prairies 
The um, other thing that came up was Blue Lake Center, which uh, allowed the two of us to work together and co-instruct so that in many things that I really wasn't skilled on, we would double up our courses and you would do the instructing and I would be doing the learning like all the other students until finally I could cover that, uh, that topic. We had some very good courses with Blue Lake Center. It was uh, a good place to work uh, at that time. I don't know if they do that sort of thing. In fact, I guess Blue Lake Center is, is a thing of the past as far as that, its original work. Yeah, I remember that uh, after meeting you, it was easy. I was involved with the Army Cadet cadets in Hinton and eventually in Edson and we used to bring them uh, occasionally to the survival school. Well this one occasion uh, there was an axe lecture on how to use an axe safely and, and uh, properly and all these cadets or high school kids are all falling asleep because of the strenuous evenings and <laughs> strenuous nights that they spent and I'm uh, watching you instruct on the axe and I'm just blown away that uh, you know how clearly and so on you're laying out all the principles of of axe work and whatever which I could appreciate because I had been using an axe as a farm boy and as a surveyor but to the army cadet boys it was a better opportunity to catch up on their sleep than to yeah. get some quality instruction but at any rate that was the insight that I got that the uh, the uh, consolidation of the knowledge of ex from experience and so on now I tell everybody you're my guru. Now, did you have a guru in this sense of of any particular person that impressed you there? I'll, I'll tell you, the first people I worked with when I was at the survival school were Roy Anderson from Harguin, and his father, his grandfather was uh, was uh, connected with the construction of the railway coming through from the east, and. Uh, his uh, his father uh, was built a house, and uh, he was a guide. Uh, he took a big time uh, uh, hunters, uh, hunters, clientele uh, from yeah, yeah, generally wealthy people from New York and that sort of thing, and uh, you know they had. Trapper, and, and, uh, uh, he was fully conversant, so I got, I was fortunate enough to, to uh, be employed with them uh, as the third instructor. And of course, I learned an awful lot just by watching them, because, you know, in this business, you realize that no one knows everything. Some people know a heck of a lot more than than you could ever imagine. Uh, mentioning uh, Mike Kelly, uh, I remember you mentioning he had a, a kind of a pastime about carrying a dictionary. <laughs> well, both Roy Anderson and Mike Kelly entered a contest. It was uh, a magazine, and um, the contest was. To, it was a puzzle. You had to have a dictionary and you had to fill in the puzzle so that the, with words that uh, would fit. And um, I was amazed. We went out for a long hike in the woods with a, with a course and he had heavy pack. Each one of them had a great big dictionary because they were working on this on this magazine's <laughs> competition. <laughs> competition to see who could who could uh, get letter like you see every letter had a certain value and uh, and the, if the more words you could get using certain letters the higher you would rate and so on 
And so it seems so strange that here's these two Bushmen up there with dictionaries. They'd be sitting up by the campfire until midnight finding words. <laughs> did, that, did that improve their general English language? <laughs> well, I imagine it did, but the thing was that they just, it was a challenge, you know. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was quite interesting to see. Uh, another thing that I uh, w want to bring up uh, that I, I, I figure is kind of unique to yourself was the signal fire, the form of signal fire that, that you taught me doesn't seem to be described anywhere else. Yeah. You know, the, uh, the, the way you'd make the platform and all the other arrangements and so on. Uh, was that something that was adopted by the military or? or well, they, they decided, we see this was a survival course and one of the things you had to do was be able to attract attention of a search aircraft. And so you would do this by laying out uh, colored like when they had colored parachutes or a white parachute in the summer, laying out things, and there was a uh, there was a different letters that you could form which had different meanings as to your requirements. Uh, that was uh, uh, well, probably one of the uh, um, things that uh, a person it put them to thinking as to as to uh, uh, all the various uses that uh, that uh, you could put things to when you were surviving. That evolution of the, si of the signal fire, uh, was that uh, mostly coming from yourself or, or were there other people had some input? Well, you see, the instructor had the, had the advantage <coughs> He would have maybe 15 people and tell each one to make a signal fire. And every time someone did that, you would think, oh, gee, that guy's got a good idea and that guy's got a good idea. And you, by collaborating with them in choosing all these different uh, ways of applying uh, to get smoke, um, it was quite a simple quite a simple operation. The, um, in the issue, of, well, you used axes and knives, and uh, I imagine there's a certain element of, of ha hazard in uh, si uh, flares, signal flares. Uh, were there many serious accidents in your career that you saw? There were a lot of cuts when people not doing what they were told to do when it comes to using an axe and knife. You know, they say with a knife, don't cut towards yourself. Well, that's pretty simple, but people do that. Uh, with an axe, what we had to emphasize was that you keep your feet well back, you bend at the hips, you keep the axe handle parallel to the ground, and you can't get cut. It's as, just as simple as that. And uh, just by hammering in those few little ideas, um, it saves a lot of trouble and a lot of bloodshed. If you just give a bunch of green hands uh, uh, axes and, and uh, let them loose, someone's going to be cut pretty darn quick. Uh, when, I, uh, when I first met you, the, the I recall the... Uh, You'd asked if I knew how to light fire with other than matches at that time. And so I, my answer was, well, uh, I don't know how to light fire without matches, but I sure got a lot of literature that explains how sort of thing. So we began to uh, teach ourselves working together, the flint and steel and the, uh, the, the, the bow drill, some of those conventional things. You recall some of that? Well, in the... we had quite a bit of a bit of fun and quite a few triumphs in, in doing that. And we worked well together uh, because, um, you know, Morris always had an open mind and, uh, and 
he came up with lots of little little hints, and I came up with a few hints. And between us, you know, two two brains are better than one quite often. And um, we sort of perfected that business of making fire uh, through improvised materials. Yeah, you have to appreciate that in those days when you tried to find a reference to help you, you just couldn't find anything. Not like today, where we have tons and tons of of uh, magazines and articles and so on. So we essentially had to read whatever we could find and then work it out till we succeeded without anyone who was skilled at anything showing us how to do anything. Uh, I actually personally found that my father knew a tremendous amount about the flint and steel. And until I said one day to my father, I said, I'll show you how we light fire with the flint and steel. He watched me for a while and I was already getting a little skilled. He says, well, let me show you how how to do it. <laughs> That's where I picked up a great deal from my father. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Tom had a, uh, in, the, in the issue of uh, knowledge, Tom would uh, always underline the fact that when you did something or you said something or wrote something down, if anybody could find a criticism, you hadn't done your homework. That people, that you had to reach a certain point where people would have to find that uh, all, you, you, uh, all you said and everything was proven, was uh, verified, was, was of that sort of state, and you don't move any further until you've resolved that issue sort of thing. Well, we have a, a, a few other things I'm starting. I'll have to look around and jot some notes. About, there are many, many questions we can get into. But basically, we, we want to say that uh, people who in the world are wondering who this Tom Roycraft was uh, or is or whatever will we'll, uh, finally find a, uh, an answer to the historical aspect of what went on in this part of the world here in the whereas we quietly worked away developing our our programs and trying to learn as much as we we could about nature and and about how man can cope if if they know what they're doing well you know you 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 deserve a lot of credit for because a lot of these things that we did it was mutual one guy would see something that the other one didn't and vice versa and between the two of us you know we made progress in so many things i'm just amazed because we were learning ourselves we had to teach ourselves before we could teach other people so i'm sure glad that i met morrison and uh, was able to work with him because he's got plenty of good ideas Thank you. <laughs>